Hi, in this video we're going to look at some vocabulary that's going to be important as we work on this chapter and then the future chapters that we'll do in this class. Alright, so some of these things are going to be related to uh, words that you talked about in maybe pre-calculus or algebra or calculus 1 or 2. Uh, so we're going to kind of try to build on hopefully what you already know. All right, so first of all, uh, really what we're after here are being able to use these words that are up here at the top, open and closed, bounded and unbounded, but all of those words rely on a couple of other definitions that we're going to start with first. All right, so I've typed these here so that I don't have to spend a lot of time writing them. Um, we want to just kind of look at some examples and make sure that we understand these definitions. All right, so first of all, we've got a point P and we define a ball of radius epsilon around P to be the set of all points that are less than epsilon units away from P. All right, so we want to think about this definition in uh, different kinds of dimensions that we've worked with. So in R1, if we're thinking about R1, we're really thinking about a number line. And so if we're thinking about a number line and we've got a point P on that, that might be a number like 7 or negative 6 or 253.7 or pi or something like that. So in that case, if we're in R1, our P would just be a, a specific value on that number line. Uh, and in this case, if we're talking about a ball of radius epsilon around P, the set of all points that are less than epsilon units away from P. So if I think about going epsilon units, I really only have two directions that I can go on a number line, left and right, or forward and backward. And so if we're thinking about all the points that are less than epsilon units away from P, that would be all the points inside this interval that goes uh, from P minus epsilon to P plus epsilon. Uh, so we're really looking at all these points inside here. It doesn't really look much like a ball, uh, but it's a little interval, or, uh, epsilon units away from P. So all the points that would be in there. In R2, so we're visualizing an XY coordinate system, so our point P would have an X coordinate and a Y coordinate. And if we think about going epsilon units away from P, we'd be looking at a circle of radius epsilon all around P. And if I want the points that are less than epsilon units away from P, that would be all the points that are inside this circle of radius epsilon around our point P here. Uh, and then in R3, uh, it's going to look more like a ball. Uh, the idea is the same as we talked about before. So we're going to have some point uh, wherever it's at. I'll just put a point here and label that. And if we think about all the points that are less than epsilon units away from P, those would be all the points that are inside a sphere of radius epsilon. So that one actually looks like a ball. Uh, the other thing to notice about this is that if you think about taking this last graph here that's in R3, this one that actually looks like a ball, but this sphere of radius epsilon around P, and if I project that down into the XY plane, if I look at the image of that down in the XY plane, what I get is this circle of radius epsilon in the XY plane which corresponds with what we were thinking about as an epsilon ball in R2, a circle of radius epsilon. And if I take that region, that ball of radius epsilon in R2, and I project that into R1, what we end up with there is really this interval of distance epsilon around P. So this idea that these higher dimensional representations of these ideas really can just be sort of reduced and reduced and reduced down into these lower dimensional ideas will be important as we continue on this semester. Okay, so ball of radius epsilon, we're basically just talking about a region around, sometimes we call this region a neighborhood, an epsilon neighborhood around a point P. Okay, so all the points that are less than epsilon units away from our point P. Okay, next set of vocabulary words here. Uh, we're going to talk about interior point and boundary point. So a point P is called an interior point of some kind of region. If there exists a ball of radius epsilon around a point P, that consists only of points that are in R. And then a point P is called a boundary point if 
every of the region R, if every ball of radius epsilon contains at least one point that is in R and at least one point that is not, and then every point is going to be either an interior or a boundary point, not both, and boundary points do not have to be included. Okay, so again, we're going to kind of look at this in R1, in R2, and in R3. So in R1, we're basically talking about number lines. And we can, when we talk about regions here, often we might be talking about intervals. So maybe we have an interval, say, that goes from 3 to 5, not including those endpoints. Or we might have an interval that goes, say, from 3 to 5, maybe including one of the endpoints, but not the other one. Okay, so for this interval, that would be a region that we're talking about, and what we want to think about for both of those regions is things that are interior points and things that are boundary points. So these words have specific mathematical definitions which have to do with these neighborhoods or balls of radius epsilon around points, or in R1 we were talking about intervals, um, but the words interior and boundary should relate to what you think about as the inside or the edge, the boundary or the edge of the regions when you just look at these regions. So when you look at these regions, if you think about the interior, uh, you would be thinking about all the points that are inside the region. So every single point that's in here where I've just made all these little red dots would be interior points for these regions for both of the intervals that I have here. All of those points that are inside there. So for example, uh, 4.89 is an interior point that would be somewhere over about here is an interior point for both of these regions. Uh, pi would be an interior point for both of these regions. That'd be a little bit bigger than 3, an interior point for both of these regions. 4 would be another example of an interior point for both of these regions. Okay, and then if I think about boundary points, we would be thinking about something at the edge of the region. So for both of these regions, uh, the, the only boundary points are 3 and 5. 3 and 5 are the boundary points. If you look at the definition, uh, if I think about that point 3 on either of these regions, that point 3, any little neighborhood that I draw or that I imagine around that point 3 is going to capture both points that are inside the region on the right side of 3 and points that are not included in the region on the left side of 3. So 3 and 5 are boundary points, they are the edge. And so that should kind of be, you can think about the definition and mathematically you need to make sure that the definition holds, but conceptually when we think about the boundary points we're really thinking about the points that are at the edge or where the region stops. So for both of these regions, both the region that does not include either 3 or 5, and then the second region that I drew that includes 3 but not 5, both of those regions have 3 and 5 as the boundary points. And notice that the boundary points do not have to be included in the region. So for both of these regions, 5 is not actually included in the region. For one of the regions, 3 is included in the second region. I've got that bracket there to indicate 3 is included, just like an interval notation. But for the first region, 3 is not included. I might put an open circle at the end of that, or maybe just parentheses at the end of that interval to indicate 3 is not included. All right, in R2, uh, I'm just going to draw a region here, and I'm going to think about, um, let's just think about the first quadrant as a region in R2. So I want just the points that are inside the first quadrant here, not including the axes. So I'm going to put little dashed lines to show not including the axes. When we did domains of functions, we thought about things like this, where we might have uh, a region that does include or does not include uh, a certain boundary. So we use dashed lines for that. All right, so for that one in R2, if my region that I'm thinking about is the first quadrant, then any point that's actually inside the first quadrant here would be an interior point. Any point that's inside the first quadrant, say the point 1, 2, is an interior point of the first quadrant. Uh, there's infinitely many of them in there. I just drew a bunch of them there. All right, and then the boundary points would be the points that are at the edge 
of this region. So for this region here, all of the boundary points would be the points that are on the coordinate axes. And because I drew those dashed lines to start with on this region, those boundary points for this region are not actually included in that region. Uh, but for this one, the boundary points would be all the points that are on the x and y axes. So for example, the point 1, 0 is a boundary point. So again, that's at the edge of the region. All right, in R3, uh, let's just think about as an example of a region in R3 here, let's think about just a sphere of radius 1, say, around some point that's here. And we're going to include all the points on and inside this sphere. Um, so if I think about that region, all of the interior points would be all the points that are inside the sphere. And for that region, boundary points would be points that are on the outside or the boundary or the edge of the sphere. All right, so um, notice in that region, since I have the entire sphere, all of those boundary points are actually included in that region. But remember, boundary points may or may not actually be included in the region. All right, let's look at the actual vocabulary words that we were really interested in here. Okay, a set R is called open if every boundary point of R is not contained in R. All right, so let's start with that and we'll look at some examples in R1. Fortunately, these words correspond to how you should think about intervals, open intervals and closed intervals. So an example of an open interval in R1 would be, for example, that interval from three to five, not including three and five. So that's an open interval, it's boundary points, three and five are the boundary points there, and those are not included in the region. None of the boundary points are included in that region. A closed region in R1, an example of that, would be like the closed interval from say three to five. All of the boundary points for that region it has two boundary points, three and five, and all of the boundary points for that region are included in the region. Uh, you might have a region that is neither. Um, so an example of that in R1 here would be, say, if I have the interval from three to five and I'm not going to include three, but I am going to include five. So that region, all those points in between three and five, not including three, but including five. I've got two boundary points. One of my boundary points is at three, which is not included. And then the other boundary point would be at five, and five is included. So these definitions here about open and closed uh, are about every boundary point is not included or every boundary point is included. If you have some, boundary points that are included and some that are not, that would be when you have an example of a region that is neither open or closed. So this would be when you have some boundary points, I'll abbreviate that here, some boundary points included and some not. Um, all right, so in R2, uh, the, one of the regions that we looked at previously was we were looking at the first quadrant not including the axes, and so I do dashed lines there to show not including those axes. So the boundary points would be all the points on the axes. So boundary points would be the boundary points on the axes. And because these are not included in the region, none of the boundary points are included in the region, we would say that this region is an example of an open region. None of the boundary points are included in that region. An example of a closed region in R2 might be the region on and inside an ellipse. Say so we've looked at that for some domains of some functions. Sometimes uh, maybe we had a region x squared over 4 plus say y squared over 1 less than or equal to 1. That would be a closed region. All of the boundary points would be the boundary points that are on the edge of that region and all of the boundary points are included in that region. So that would be an example of a closed region in R2. All right, in R3, uh, one of the regions we looked at for an example in our previous uh, problem where we were talking about interior points and boundary points was a sphere, including the edge of the sphere. 
So if I'm talking about all of the points on and inside the sphere, uh, that would be a closed region. The boundary points would be all the points that are on the sphere, and because they're included in the region, that would be an example of a closed region. Okay, so we'll look at some more examples in some later videos of those, but uh, I want to go ahead and talk about two more vocabulary words before we go on to that. All right, so the last two vocabulary words here are bounded and unbounded, and these really have to do with distances. Region R is called bounded if all of its points lie within some ball of finite radius. And so basically we're talking here about distances between all the points in the region, and those distances have to stay finite. I cannot find any distances between points that uh, go off to infinity, so where I have infinitely far points from other points in the same region. Uh, region R is called unbounded if there is no ball of finite radius that contains all of R, or in this one the distances get infinite. The definitions have to do here with these balls, these epsilon neighborhoods or balls, uh, but conceptually you can think about whether the distances between the points stay finite or get infinite. Uh, I'm going to just look at in R2 and R1 here. Uh, we can also draw those in R3 if we want. In R1, a bounded interval might be the interval from 3 to 5, either containing the endpoints or not, but all of those points are a finite distance away from each other, so that would be an example of a bounded interval or bounded region. An unbounded region, an example of one of those, might be the interval that goes from 3 to infinity. Let's include 3 on this one. Unbounded region here, including 3 and then going off to infinity. Um, so because those points on the right side of that get infinitely far away from my point here at 3, for example. That would be an example of an unbounded region in R1. Um, in R2, one of the regions that we've been looking at was just the first quadrant, not including those edges. That would be an example of an unbounded region in R2. Those distances get infinite. Those are going off forever. Uh, to the right, so you get points that are farther and farther and farther away from any point that's over here kind of near the origin. Uh, an example of a bounded region in R2 might be the points that are inside, let's, let's draw a dashed boundary here, but the points that are inside an ellipse, so for example x squared over 4 plus y squared over 1 is less than 1. Uh, that would be a bounded region. All those points are within finite distance of each other. I can make an epsilon ball that contains all those points in that region. So bounded and unbounded, sometimes students get that really confused with um, closed and open, and so they think about bounded and unbounded as having to do with whether the boundary is included or not. But these, these vocabulary words really have to do with distances and whether the distances in the region stay finite or go off to infinity. Okay, so we'll look at some examples in the next video where we apply these words to think about domains and ranges of functions.